but because she was, you know, no, we need to get married as soon as possible before people finds out that I'm, I'm pregnant. Played low ball. Um, I got married to him, and she just changed. Introducing the epitome of luxury living, Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulous. So when you walked in, um, I was like, eh! My man, today we are interviewing Davido. <laughs> Come on, do I look like Davido? Uh, the jacket, the glasses, oh, it's wow. like superstar level. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, um, brother, uh, thank you for coming to the show. Sure. Uh, and being kind enough to share your story with us. Uh, geez, we've, we, we've had many stories to be shared, but we believe that each story comes with its unique aspect and, sure. and there will be growth and power ignited for, for, for our audience and the mm -hmm. people we serve, which is our audience, um, by having this platform. Um, who are you? What is your name? And where were you born? And where do you come from? Let, let's start with those basics. OK. Um, my name is Kaspar mm -hmm. from uh, a neighboring country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. OK. Yes. An apostle. Um, I had a church. Had? Uh, had a church. Okay. Yeah. A uh, very big church in, in our neighboring country. Yeah. Um, 500 city church. Mm -hmm. Three mm -hmm. different assemblies in, in different cities. Um, I grew up there as, um, as an orphan. Sure. Yeah, I loved God so much. And um, when did you lose your parents? Uh, when I was five. Both parents? My, my my mom died when I was five, and my dad died when I was seven. Okay. Yeah. Jeez, you so have no just, recollection of those people. No, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I grew up by myself, loving God. I was depending on God more than anything else. I get that. So I grew up so fast. I matured so fast. And at the age of six, 16, uh, no, 17, that's when I went to Bible College to start okay. my, uh, my uh, diploma for theology. Sure. Yeah, I finished after three years from that. Uh, and then I went to submit under a certain pastor Sure. Uh, for some time. And then 2017, that's when I opened my ministry. Yes. What is life life? rather what is life like in an orphanage um somebody out there uh, grew up in an orphanage and perhaps their experience uh, is similar to yours somebody out there actually grew up with both parents mm -hmm. and they have no understanding of what it's like to be an orphan hence how they relate with people who have lost their parents mm -hmm. is very distorted perhaps they don't know how to deal with their boyfriend or their wife or their husband who doesn't have parents because they don't understand the traumas that go into growing up in an orphanage or without parents i mean for you specifically what 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 stands out for you with the of for life in an orphanage um i can say Growing up without parents is the worst thing that mm -hmm. I would want anyone else to be, even my enemies, to be in, in such an environment sure. where you don't have you don't have anyone to guide you. Uh, I, I grew up with my brothers, and my brothers were drunkards, serious ones. But then I thank God now they are born again, all of them. Um, it wasn't easy because that time they did not understand um, who I was, what God had put inside of me. 
So imagine you are with you are with your brothers and they don't understand who really you are as a younger brother. Hmm. Already that's that's where everything that's where problems starts when they do not understand the other person because your parents are the ones who are supposed to understand you and nature you to become that which God has um, ordained you to become. So me growing up as a Christian boy and uh, I loved God so much. My brothers did not understood that. Uh, to the extent that I lost my parents and I lost my brothers at the same time. Hmm. Um, you I lost them to alcoholism, you lost your parents to death. Exactly. Yeah. So I was by myself and uh, it, it, it used to really uh, weigh me down so strong whenever I could see my friends with their parents moving around. You know, I always wanted to, 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 to to have my parents nurturing me and guiding me towards my, my destiny. And uh, I remember uh, me growing up, it, it wasn't easy for me to really connect with other people, even with my spiritual parents in the Lord, because I, I did not understand what it means to have a father. Hmm. Uh, I would relate to them in a different way. Mm -hmm. When they want me to do something else, I, I'm doing something else totally different because I don't know anything about that. I did not grow up in such a setup where I am supposed to be told what to do, what not to do. Yeah. I was doing everything by myself. I remember um, I would I would go to uh, my neighbor's field and make sure that the whole field is empty. I would make sure with my brother would steal food, would steal the grain meals. We would, would go into into the other people's fields to make sure that we are surviving. So it was not easy for me growing up as an orphan and also other people I was around with, they did not understood uh, what it means to lose a parent. Sure. Yeah, someone could just come and say nasty things about your uh, your parents, but you, you, you really want them to understand like what they're saying is, it's, it doesn't sit well with me, you know, so uh, it's, it was unfortunate that how my mom died was a sudden death. She just woke up dead. She was not sick. So it took me a very long time to, uh, to get through all that and to accept that it has surely happened. I remember I used to cry every year, every month, every day, huh. every night. I had sleepless nights uh, until I was 27. Yeah. Now I'm 29. Yeah. Yes. I would cry, I would sob. When, when I'm in church, people would think, ah, that guy is, is in the spirit. spirit. Yeah. But when I'm not, I was busy thinking of my parents. I wish they were here. When I'm preaching, sometimes I would cry on the pulpit. I wish my parents were here to just see me doing these great things. So it wasn't easy growing up as an orphan. And um, uh, the, the, my setup was really a crazy setup because... It was an, in, an independent setup. Everyone was just supposed to do whatever they want to do. You cook your meal, my brother comes and he cooks his meal. My other brother comes, he cooks his meal. And at the end of the day, they want me to clean all those because I was the youngest, to clean the plates and to make sure that everything is okay, or doing all the home chores. So um, it was really difficult and painful season for me losing my parents. It was one of the worst things that has ever happened to me. and. I wish people would really understand that orphans really need um, an extra care. Huh. Uh, they really need to be to be seen and to be, you know, to just nurture them into becoming the best uh, versions of themselves. Some of them, they, some of them, they end up losing their um, they end up losing their potential, not because uh, they were born like that. No, because oh, they're talentless. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Some of them, they end up getting into the streets. Yeah. Uh, and become. Uh, serial killers, you know, mm -hmm. but it's not because it's not like that's who they really are. Yeah, yeah. So I would, I would, I would really appreciate if, if, if people begin to uh, take an extra, um, I don't know how I can put it, to have an extra care for orphans. Why? Because if we, if we leave orphans out there, no one is going to be there for them to show them the right direction. You know, there's there's other th there's there's one thing when someone else is doing uh, something wrong, right? And they do not know 
uh, how to do right. Okay. Right. Okay. Someone is doing something wrong. Because no one because, taught them how to yes, do right. Because they, no one taught them how to do right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So we end up expecting people um, to do what's right. But who has ever sat down with them and hmm. tell them how exactly to do right? Because doing right is not... Automatic. It's, it's not automatic. Yeah, yes. yeah. It, it has to be... Somebody has to teach you how sure. to do right. Sure. So you end sure. up blaming people for doing something wrong because they do not know how to do right. So some of the people who are out there and, you know, you, you don't want to see them when they come close to your car. When they come closer to your car, you just don't want to talk to them. Hmm. And ask if you ask them how they grew up, then you understand hmm. they lacked that, that, that nurturing moment. They lacked fatherhood or motherhood. Hmm. Even me, I never really enjoyed my motherly love and fatherly love. I don't know what it meant. I don't know what it means until mm. now. Mm. So um, I, I would wish people would just try their best to be there for orphans because that's where, that's where everything starts. Yes. If, if, yeah. if, if you don't help them at their tender age, if you don't help them um, in their lonely moments, mm. no one else is going to help them because they're just going to make decisions, drastic decisions, because they want to survive. How are you lonely as a pastor? Uh, my, my, my immediate understanding is that you're a pastor. You're surrounded by hundreds of people yes. all the time, almost on a daily basis. You have staff, you have team members. In your case, you have a wife. Uh, surely this whole structure around you means that Pastor Casper, Bishop Casper, Prophet Casper, you'll correct me, is so well surrounded and has all the support system mm. he needs. Why do you suffer from loneliness, loneliness rather, while you are surrounded by so many people? Um, it's a tricky question, but I think as for me, it, it, was, not, it was not because I was, uh, I, was, I was too lonely but I, I, I didn't have that courage to really be vulnerable to the people whom I was close with. Okay. L letting them know how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. um, I was afraid if, if, if people are gonna discover my, my weaker side. Uh, you know, you don't want your church members to know that you, sometimes you cry. Hmm. These are pains of the pastors, pastor, mm -hmm. which pastors go through and some members don't understand that pastors are human beings. Mm -hmm. First, they really yes, they are, they they also need to be to be heard mm -hmm. and to be seen. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes it's, it's just good to ask your pastor, "Are you okay?" Besides you wanting a blessing from him, but just asking him, "Are you okay? Is everything okay emotionally, uh, physically? Is everything okay?" Because at some point we tend to forget that pastors are hundred percent human because you've seen them performing miracles or preaching powerful messages, sometimes we are preaching for the people. And sometimes we are touching other people's lives and forgetting about our lives. Hmm. So I'd preach powerful sermons and go back home and break down, you know. And while I'm preaching, I feel so lonely. I wish I could just talk to someone. But at the same time, the, 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 that person you want to talk to is your child, is your son, it's your, it's your daughter. So I can't open up to them to, um, to that extent. So sure. I say, no, 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 I'm okay, you know, everything is okay. But I suffered for a long time because I could not open up to people about my, my background, on how I grew up and uh, the pain that I was going through of losing my parents. Do you think you got into ministry to shield the pains that you were going through um, not negating, obviously, that you had a calling mm -hmm. and um, God had, had called you to be a shepherd to his people. Mm -hmm. But do you think a huge part of how you used ministry is to cover up the pains? Um, it, it was my therapy, I can say. I do not sure. want to run away sure. from that. Sure. Because it was something that I was born to do. I found happiness from it. I okay. found peace. I found mm -hmm. strength out of it. So it was not like a cover up, but it was my my survival skill. It was my therapy. I know mm -hmm. if I preach, I'd come back home better. Which is not bad because if you're operating in your calling and it gives you happiness, that's okay. Yes. Yeah. So for me, I, I found out I found happiness in in ministering, and that helped me to keep keep going, regardless of how painful it was. Yeah. So I kept on preaching, even though when I had I was hurt. Even though I was in pain of losing my parents, 
but I, I survived because I was doing one thing that I loved the most, which was ministering and touching lives, changing lives, making sure that people have gotten to their God-given destiny. When did you start the church? When did you open doors to your first church and why? Mm. I think it was it was high time. I, I, like I said, I matured so quickly, quickly because of responsibilities <laughs> which I had. I had a younger brother and I had three brothers who were supposed to look after. And uh, that made me to seek God more mm -hmm. because I had no one to depend on. Mm -hmm. So the more I seek as the first of God, I found strength from God. I found strength from the Word of God, from what God has been telling me about ministry and about my future. So I'd hop on, on, on my ministry. So I, I opened my church, um, that was 2016. Okay. No, 2015. 15, yeah, nine started, years ago. Yeah, nine years ago. Yeah. I opened it as a, an, inter, an interdenominational at first. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for for those who are not familiar? Okay, an interdenominational. It's a um, where it's a, it's a group. It's a it's a denomination that uh, allows everybody to come from different denominations. Okay. Whether you're Catholic or Pentecostal yeah. or mainline, okay. you are allowed to come and worship together. Okay. Yes. So I moved with that. Um, as I was trying to find balance in my ministry on, and, and finding balance in my giftings, where exactly am I, where exactly is my strength, the prophetic, the apostolic, where exactly. So I took that moment to really discover more about myself, more about more, my calling before I gave, uh, I, gave, I gave out the vision to the people, my vision. So after AA, that's when I opened my ministry, which was called Voice of High International Ministries. Um, it grew so fast because I, I had no problem emotionally, spiritually, yes, physically. I was trusting God for greater things. I, I, I opened doors to, um, to my church um, in, in different cities. Why? Because I, I, it, I felt like it, it was high time for me to t begin to touch lives in a different way. I wanted a structure. I wanted to... I wanted to move forward. I wanted to have progress and advancement in, in my ministry life. I did not just want to continue preaching like uh, you know, someone, somebody who doesn't have direction. Sure. So it's another thing, preaching, and it's also another thing, preaching with direction. Sure, sure. I wanted direction. I wanted a structure. I wanted, to, I wanted something that I could touch, something I could leave for my kids, an inheritance. That was what I was building. So when I opened a ministry, I had all that in mind. I had all that on my heart wanting to touch lives and moving things differently. Nine years ago, you were 20 years old, if I believe. You can say that again. Yes. Why, as a 20-year-old, are you opening a ministry? Surely many people are going to scam. Who's this new scammer now opening a church? Right. And did you not face that criticism that you are too young to be opening a church and to be the leader and the founder of the church? Um, it was fortunate that people did not believe that I was young. Okay. Yes, and I did not tell people about my age. Okay. I did not open up about that. So people would just think, because of my maturity, okay. of, because of the way I handled people, yeah. um, the way I handled ministry, yeah. people really never had a problem with me starting a church at that age. Mm -hmm. Because obviously nobody knew about my age. If I tell people that I'm 19, they would say, ah, Kaspar, you're lying. Mm -hmm. you probably 24 or 25. So... That helped me a lot. Sure. Yes. My age and my maturity, they were not like... Um, an on, issue. Yeah, they were not an issue to the... To, the congregants. You know, to the congregants. Yeah, they yeah. never really tried to uh, have a problem with it. Some they knew, mm -hmm. some they did not know, but nobody ever had a problem with it because I was, I was doing everything in a mature way, which is what they really wanted. The church also has the pressure to then be in a family unit um, outside of parents uh, the, 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 the church doesn't care too much whether you have parents or not yeah but specifically they want to see you having a, a wife and kids they want to see uh, in in isizulu we call it umamfundis yeah 
um, which is the pastor's wife, uh, mm -hmm. the mother of the church, the mm -hmm. queen of the house. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard all sorts of lady. terms. The first lady, correct, mm -hmm. that's the one I was looking for. Um, uh, do you, did you ever feel pressure when you just started the church to fulfill that? Or did you only fulfill it as per your own wishes in a time that you felt was right? Um, I can say, okay, when I, when I started, when I opened my church... Um, 2015. 2015. I felt like, at some point, I felt like, hey, I'm too young for this. At the same time, I felt like, hey, it's too early. The people that knew me, my spiritual parents, they said, ah, Kasper, you're too, you're too young. And it is also a problem in the ministry when somebody opens a church uh, very young. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a big problem, uh, which, which pastors need to really look into. If when you're nurturing somebody, also ask them about their age. How old are you? If you're a 19-year-old guy, you haven't seen a lot. Mm -hmm. You haven't experienced a lot out there. So age will always catch up with you later. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. So uh, it wasn't a problem, but it became a problem late mm -hmm. because there are things, there are stages that I felt like, hey, I skipped this. I should have maybe handled this. I should have maybe uh, done this before I got into ministry. You know, so all those things will start catching up with you. Like what? Being yourself, being a young person, enjoying my 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 teenage. Uh, moments I did not have all that, mm -hmm. yeah. so I was a spiritual guy, loving God so much, holy, but my age caught up with me late. Holy, you're referring to right down to purity. Right down to purity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then so age then comes in. Age comes in. Yeah. So now I'm 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 19, right? I got married when I was 19. Now I'm 19 and I am moving my interdenomination and the church grew within a year with more than 200 plus people. Uh, and obviously, like what you said, people expect you to have a wife. Sure. Yes, as our custom. It's not like it's a must. It's what I believe. It's not like it's a must. You must be, you must have a wife. You can do ministry without a wife. Mm -hmm if God allows you to, because pastors have got different covenants with God. Sure. Some, some of them, God tells them not to do this, don't do this, don't do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it was a different story because my community was, were expecting me to have, a, to have a woman now because of the background that I came from. I came from a mainline church. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a must. But I was a young, young boy. I did not know anything about marriage. Yes, I knew everything about ministry and spiritual life. But when it comes to marriage, marriage. Yeah, that's where uh, the problems began. Okay. So I got married to my wife, and she was 10 years older than me, and I did not know about it. Um, she was 29, you were 19. Yes. What do you mean you didn't know? I so did, yes, I did not so know. How, how much longer after meeting her, do you marry her? After a month. Yeah, I had so much pressure. I wanted to have that, that picture, you know, I wanted, I was admiring other, other prophets, you know, with their wives. And I, 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 was, I said, no, this is a good thing. Why, why don't I do it? I can do it. I've got money to take care of my, my, my family. Let me just, let me just go for it. And she had to um, lie to me uh, about her age. Do you think it's because she knew yours? She knew mine, yes. Okay, yes, okay. Yes, yes. I was very open about my age. So she lied because also she wanted to get married, you know. Who doesn't want a pastor who's 19? Who doesn't want to have a husband who's running a church? And it's uh, looking successful. It's looking successful, you know. So ladies were on me like crazy. And I had to just choose one person. Hmm. And maybe because, uh, because of the immaturity of life in general and my age, I had my reasons why I wanted to get married. And I had uh, 
I had things that I was looking at. If I wanted to choose someone, I think I need someone who has got this, somebody who's like this, somebody who's like this. What were you looking at? What should they have? What is that ideal wife at the time? Um, I wanted a very submissive wife, someone who, who can be there for me, mm -hmm. ministry-wise, who would never destroy it. Mm -hmm. right? And when, I, when, when she came to me, I wasn't the one who, ca who she came to me, gave me a car, said, wow, this is what I'm looking for, this is the kind of a woman I'm looking for. Gave you a car? A car, hair and car. You, and you didn't have one On at my the time? Birthday, I didn't have one at the okay. time. Okay. Yes. On your birthday as a gift? As a gift. So all along I was just using my church members' cars, very good cars, yes, I, I, but I did not have any a car. That is yours? That is mine, yes. Sure. So she brought it to me. I had no choice. If somebody does that to you, obviously, you know what it means. I had no choice. I loved her. She was a very good person. And then after that, I did not wear it for any longer. I, I, I engaged her. I had to uh, engage her and promise that I'm going to get married to you, have our kids. But then problems continued with my age. I'm 19, I think I was now 20 years. And um, she was already pregnant. I wanted to, I had to cover it up. I'm a pastor and I'm, the, I'm a father figure. And my, my fiance. So you're not married yet, but she's pregnant. She's pregnant. So um, I had no choice I had to rush. Go get pay Lobola quickly, and I had no money. I think on that time I had no money, and she said, "I'm gonna give you money for Lobola." Hmm. I refused. I said, "No, no, no, you can't." To me, they did not sit well with me. I said, "No, yeah, no, no, no yeah, you can't yeah. do that." But then she, she insisted. I had no choice. Then took the money, went and paid Lobola. But in my mind, I did not digest that as Lobola because mm -hmm. I said, "Okay, if you if you have given me this." Allow me to give it back to you, maybe after a month or so. But still, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't bringing up a good picture to me. I was. I was frustrated about that. So stressed about it. But because she was, you know, no, we need to get married as soon as possible before people finds out that I'm, I'm pregnant. Paid low ball. Um, got married to him. And she just changed. Everything changed from that time. My ministry life changed from that very moment. The moment I got married to her, she now has a paper, an Ill a legal paper that shows like this is my wife. And that's where everything started. She changed into who really she was, monster. Um, you know, uh, a lot of things um, in one person. She, because she was a little bit, I'm can, uh, she was financially stable than me. Okay, because yes. she's older. She's, she's older. Yeah, yes, yeah. she's yeah. worked a long she's, time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had now three cars with us. She bought other three cars. She's been traveling all over buying me suits from different countries. Huh. You know, I was very appreciative because it was a plus to my ministry. Sure. You know, um, it looked good for the ministry. Yes, yeah. for the ministry. Yes, it looked good for the ministry. Um, now I was suffering from the... Um, I was now catching up with my edge. Okay. You know, I want to be myself. Yeah. And I'm now a responsible man. But you have to, but you still want to explore who you I are st I st I and your desires explore, exactly, and because she knows she 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 she's someone who who knows my age she knows that she's older than me, she could not let me be myself. Mm -hmm. So she was really so insecure uh, about my whereabouts, and she began a go to different people, have you seen Apostle? Have you seen my husband? I did not, I, I can't find him, you know. And all of a sudden, 
um, I, I, I realized that I'm losing people in the ministry. Okay. I'm losing, yeah, I'm, I started losing... Especially core key people. Yes. Yeah, like board members. Exactly. Yeah. I should go to this person uh, because I had my close church members, mm -hmm. my protocol, mm -hmm. uh, the team that I used to move around with. Some of them were very influential in... in uh, in, in my in, in my country. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, she did not want anyone who had more money than hers. She never wanted anybody close to, be around to me you. to be around me. Sure. So she began to chase away those people in different ways. She would call that one, I don't want you close to my husband, you're the one who is um, teaching him all these wrong all things. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Teaching, yeah. It's, you know, and it was not true. Because I wasn't doing anything wrong by that time, so I, it, I was I was so frustrated. I I could not preach anymore. I could not, and because remember, I'm young. I'm mm -hmm. twenty. Mm -hmm. I have I've never been through this kind of stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was it was worse than what I thought. My ministry started crumbling. I ran my ministry after I got married to her for six six years. Six years, I'm, I'm running my ministry. So, um, when we started fighting because of me not coming back home, because I, didn't want, I did not want to come back home because there was no peace at mm -hmm, home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd make sure that I'd come back home around 3 a.m. and she's asleep. And I know early in the morning she's going to wake up and go to work. And I'm still asleep. And... Obviously, there's no way she'd try and wake me up to say, let's talk about this, because already it would be dramatic. So that, that was my life now. I did not want to come back home. What are you doing when you're away from home? I rented an apartment somewhere hmm. where I was now staying. Does she know about this apartment? She did not know. Because obviously, if she knew, mm -hmm. she would come and make you know, things worse. Mm -hmm. And... She went to different church members. My husband is no longer coming home. And I, I lost my key, key, key members. And I tried to um, speak to her. You know what? Um, this is my life. This is, this, is, this is what I love the most. This is what I know the best. Please guard it jealously. If our problems... Uh, if we cannot solve our problems, please, let's try to find uh, better ways to solve them. Without involving the Without church. Without involving the church. Yeah. Because this is our company. This is where we sure. are we're being fed. Come on, let's just try and solve things in an um, amicable way. So she didn't want that because she felt like she's losing me. She's losing his, uh, his young uh, pastor. I can say... On that one, it's, it's a, it was a dangerous decision, which I did. Which is having the apartment? No. A dangerous decision was accepting the car. Okay. That the very first decision. The very first decision sure. was and accepting then, the car. And then accepting Lobola Man. Accepting Lobola Man. I made drastic decisions, which I regret right now. Sure. Yeah. That was bad decisions. I was driving, yes, but I was not happy. Hmm. My spiritual parents would know, hey, this guy is just doing all these things, but he's not okay. I would, I would open up to them, you know what, I'm not okay. I don't want to preach. Can you please come preach to my church? You'd come and preach three, four times a month. I don't want to preach. And you know what, I ended up, I started drinking. Mm -hmm. Yes. I Did just, she know? She didn't know, and I didn't want her to know. So you're doing even the drinking privately yes. in your apartment? Yes, but sometimes I'd want to come back home because I, maybe it's a Saturday. Uh -huh. I want to prepare for Sunday. But I'm drunk. And she did not know that she's the one who has made me to start doing that. Hmm. So I'm back at home and I'm drunk. She calls all the church members. Your pastor is here. He's drunk. He's not a man of God. He's satanic, blah, 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 blah. And church members comes, what is it? I refused to open the door. I said, no, guys, I need to sleep. I'm not drunk. And for sure, I was drunk. 
But I could not explain to people why I'm drunk. So, how, how, did, how did it start? It? Yeah, yeah. And I allowed people to judge me. I lost those church members because I was staying where I was, I was staying in an eight bedroom house hmm. with my children, the keyboardist, blah, blah. And whenever we had a problem, she would wake everybody up. Come hmm. here. If your pastor is here, he's drunk. So she thought she's trying to deal with me, but she did not know that she was actually destroying the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, because I'm a young girl, I'm a, I'm a young boy, I do not want to be a divorcee at a, at a younger age. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want that. Like you're 25 um, or something. Yes. No, that was before that. I was, sure. That was before I, I was 25. Okay. All this. Yeah. yeah. I endured it for all these years. I allowed her to burn my suits. Sometimes I wake up and all my suits are, are in the tub. What's happening? You're not going to church. You can wear shorts and go to church. I'm like, come on, you can't do that. You know, I wear suits for church. You can't, you can't do that. Should burn papers, maybe my passport. I can't find my passport. I need to travel somewhere. I'm invited to come and minister. And maybe I'm a guest somewhere, and the next thing I'm being called from, from that church. Oh, I'm sorry, Papa. So we cannot we cannot continue with uh, with our program because your wife has sent us messages to say you are not a man of God. You're not a true man of God. We must not allow you to on or you must not allow you on our pulpit. So I lost friends. I lost very important people, fatherly figures. You know, I could not. I could not enjoy it anymore. Uh, I think that was that was now when I was twenty five. When I said I think it's a high time I need to I need to detach myself from this person. And now we've got a son, and I'm afraid. I know my people how they're gonna take this, and. One day I came back home very, very drunk, but I did not want it. I told her, you know what, I'm coming back home, but I don't want to fight with you. Just allow me to have peace and go and minister. So I had, about, I had 10 groups, WhatsApp groups. I got back home, where's my food? Oh, there's your food. I began to eat, and I was on my phone. You know, and I blacked out. She took my phone, went through my phone, started sending messages to each and every popular person, you know, nasty things. She had my nude pictures. That was so stupid of me doing that, eh? I regret. She took them from your phone? So she, no, 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 no. She took me a picture before we got married. Okay. Yes. So she took that nude picture, posted it. It was all over social media. The next morning, all my church groups, I saw everybody, they left the groups. Exiting the groups. Yeah, exiting the groups. I was, I, I did not know what to do, who to, who to call, uh, where to go. Uh, and there she is, I'm trying to talk to him. What's up? What's your problem? Exactly. What 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 problem do you have with me? And she's like, no, you you don't give me attention anymore. You're just doing church things. I'm like, is it is it not the reason why I got married to you because hmm. I wanted you because you have been a, a good support to the ministry. So why do you feel like it's not it's not right now? <laughs> I was a very busy person. If I can say. Those days, I had more than I could get four or five invitations a month from different churches. Sure, sure. And she did not want that, so she destroyed all my connections around, and I was okay with it. I said, ah, anyway, it's fine. And then one of our church members had given us a house, that eight-bedroom house which mm. we were using, and a car, and some church members had. Um, it was a fully furnished uh, apartment which she had bought for for me. And then she called that, that lady and say, why did you give my husband that house? 
you are a witch, you are a satanist, you want to kill my husband, you want to kill my baby, come and please remove us. And by that time, I wasn't at home, come and remove us here, yeah, we, we don't want your house. And that's the only house I have. Hmm. And you know, that, 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 that couple, they loved me so much because they had seen the great, greater things happening in their lives through me. They loved me so dearly. And they called me, uh, Apostle, where are you? I said, ah, I'm at home. Where's Mama? I said, no, Mama, she's not around. She went, she, she went to the village. Um, she will come back maybe next week. And they said, we are coming there. We want to see you. They came with the husband with a, with a gun. I said, hey, what is it? And they said, ah, if we see you here, it was on Wednesday. They said, if we see you here until Friday, we are going to kill you. I said, why? 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 What's, what's the problem? And they played the voice notes for me. My guy, it was, it was, I don't know how I can explain it. it it, it wasn't good. It was the worst of worst notes I've ever had. Insulting them, insulting the couple, um, telling them to stop giving me things. I'll support my husband. I'll buy him a house myself. So I lost that house, and I thought I thought I was dreaming. They took the house and the car. And they had given me a very big farm uh, with 10,000 chickens. And she said, please come and take everything from this, from this place. We don't want anything to do with you. And I'm not aware of that. And they asked me, Apostle, did we, some, we, did we do something wrong to you? What, what crime did we commit that to deserve such a treatment from your wife? Mm. Uh, you know, hearing that coming from elderly people, it was it was it was painful, and I I I was I was now in a position where I could just take them as my parents, those guys. So they came, the wife came, without the husband. She cried, in front of my face. She was sobbing, tears. She could not say anything. I said, "Why are you crying?" She's saying, "I'm crying because." I, so, so she drove me. She drove with me to where I've met them, the, fa the first place. Right. So we we went there and parked the car, and she started crying. I said, Mama, don't do that to me. I know things are not okay. What do you want me to do? You know I'm a child. Don't do this to me. She said, I'm here because I want to remind God how I am regretting meeting you. Hmm. Yes. So I'm crying here because this is where I've met you for the first time. And I want you to feel it. I want you to, I want you to feel my pain. So I'm leaving you here, where I've met you. I'm, I'm telling God, it's I'm done with with you. You know, and these people, I needed them the most because I was, they were in the process of building a sh um, um, very beautiful uh, structure for me, for the church. And it was now halfway. You know. I lost those people. I lost the house. I lost the, I lost the church, um, and I was left with few, a few people. And okay, I had three assemblies in three different cities. Mm -hmm. right? The other one in about three hundred people. The other one at hundred plus. The other one was in uh, these, you know, like Centon. Mm. And about 60 people, but you know, the 60 people can actually take care of mm, all mm, the mm, responsibility mm, yeah. of the church. Yeah. So I lost all that in one day. How did this happen? All these guys uh, came together, connived to uh, come and see me, but they wanted to beat me up. They wanted to beat me up. So they came and we met at a certain hotel. And I, I, when I met them, I just went on my knees and said, I'm so sorry for what happened with uh, me and my, my wife. It was never my intention. I never wanted this to happen. I did not know. If I knew, I could have done something better. Forgive me. So uh, they did not take it lightly. They were shouting at me, you know, I had to run away from that hotel room. I 
went back home, not home as such because I had no home by that time. I went back to my spiritual father and he took me in, explained to him what had happened. He said, I can go and speak to these people, you know, maybe they can, they can change their mind towards you. You have helped them. You have, some of them, they were at the verge of uh, losing their marriages and all that. You stood with them. And some of them, they were sick. You look at them. Let's talk to them. Let me remind them. He tried to remind them, uh, but it did not work because I'd already uh, lost the, the courage to continue doing ministry. Where is she? She's, she's at her mom's place and she's calling each and everybody, hey, um, Apostle said he came and prayed for you and your car turned into a snake. You know, these big stories, unbelievable stories, like things that never happened. And so these people came, they were powerful people. They, they wanted me dead. You know, imagine, imagine having someone who used to bow down before you, touch your feet, cry on you, or cry in front of you on the altar. Apostle, thank you for this and this. And that person is now calling you by your name. Hey, Casper, I want to kill you. You know, it, I, it, was, it was worse than losing my parents. Hmm. Yes. Because now I was losing a vision. I was losing something that I was born to do. It was, it was, the pain was just, was just too much. And I've realized that many pastors go through this kind of pain, especially with marriages, because some of them can't really open up to people. Hmm about how they are suffering with their wives because now you have portrayed a certain picture like people follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah, if you follow me, you go to heaven. Now people have got this picture about you like you are Jesus. And it's something that I've learned uh, after I lost my ministry. I was just supposed to be, um, to be open and to be human mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to show people that I can also make mistakes mm -hmm. um, I can also get angry I did not have that courage to show people my human side as, as much as it is very important especially when such situations happens you, you really have to remind them that you know I have told you that I'm human I've once said it you have seen me doing this and that that, that shows you I, I'm human so it was now, it was, it was worse for me because of how I'd portrayed a, a certain picture. So pastors go through this because they can't, they can't divorce hmm. because of... Divorce is a sin. Yeah, it's a sin. Yeah. And also this brand you've created. You've created, yeah, yes. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and you're not happy. Your wife insults you in front of the kids. You can't divorce it because the Bible says, do not divorce it. Some, 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 some pastor's wives, they beat up the husband. Hmm. And you have to go to church. And most of pastor's wives are, most of them are financially stable than the husband. Because mm -hmm. pastors have this, this tendency of getting married to rich girls, beautiful girls for posters and for banners and mm -hmm. all that. To have that, to portray a certain image, sure. you know, the king and the queen. But ministry, I've realized it's, it's not about that. Mm. It is, it is, it's, it's, it's about getting married to someone whom God has ordained for you. Mm. Be it ugly or uneducated or not rich. But most pastors, they actually know who exactly they're supposed to get married to, but they don't want. They want that image, that fake image. So most of them, they are in deep shit right now. They cannot get out of it because there's no an exit. But it takes courage for one person to say, I'm, I'm done with this person. With, the, with this entire life yes. as well. Yeah, as well. Yeah. Because some of them, they die prematurely. They've got diseases, heart problems, most of them, because of their wives. And they can't tell the congregation that, you know what? I'm in trouble with this woman. I've got sleepless nights. Every Saturday before you go to church, your wife has to shout at you, has to insult you. So you cannot tell anyone that because you know it's going to implicate the, the whole church setup. You might lose it. 
fast forward, I'm mm. assuming you've divorced her now. Yes. And you guys live separate lives. Yes. Um, first question, did you give up on ministry? Did this hurt you to the point where you give up, you gave up on ministry or are you currently on a break from ministry? And remember you said to me when you were younger, you didn't have an opportunity to find yourself. Yeah. Do you think you know who you are now? Yeah, I know who I am. I have managed to find myself along the way. Um, like I said, um, when I got married to her, she was my first girlfriend. And she was the first girlfriend, she was the first person I got married to. All along I was busy trying to live a holy life, mm -hmm. focus on ministry, you know, making sure that I do not want to disappoint my brothers and the people from my village. I want to make it. I was focusing on that. But I did not give myself time to really find myself in terms of who I really want to, who I really am. Whom, what, what is it about me that, that, that is like a mystery about me? I wanted, I did not give myself to discover a mystery about me. Because every man of God has a mystery. Every person has got a mystery about them. But apart from preaching, you need to really discover who you are. Who really you are. Yes, because being yes. a pastor, yes, you are a man of God. But who really are you? Most pastors don't give themselves to uh, discover who really they are. Why? Because at the end of the day, you yeah. find you, you, you will just catch up with it later. When you, that can only be seen when you cannot handle situations because situations are what really defines who you are. How are you going to handle it? Mm -hmm. Because who you are is the person who's supposed to handle this situation. Yeah. So it was, I, I, got, I divorced them. But at the same time, um, it wasn't easy for me to really discover, to find out, because I was overwhelmed with so, so many things. I've lost a church, I've lost congregation, I lost my family. They do not want to talk to me anymore because they feel like I've, I've uh, abandoned them for, for what I like, for who I think I am. Um, a lot of people were not happy with me. They were angry. My community, uh, you know, it 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 became worse than that. It, to the extent that even the even the uh, the people were not from my church. They, they they were now concerned about my 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 issue because she was now all over in different social media platforms posting that pastor this this apostle is not a man of God. He was drinking. This one is this. I do not. I do not love him because of this and that and that and that. So, some of them wanted to, wanted me dead. Some of the church members they never wanted me to preach again. And some pastors in my community never wanted to see me holding a microphone because they felt like I am I'm the worst pastor. You're a false prophet. I'm a false prophet. Right now, are you content with how you are living your life? the things that you've discovered about yourself, some of those things are things that um, the Christian community may not particularly boldly speak about or prefer, even though they know our truths and our people's lived realities and people's lived experiences. And do you believe that God still loves you and you're still a born again child of God in that life you are living now? Yes. I believe I'm a child of God. I believe... I am not going to hell. Mm -hmm. Hell is not mine. Hell is not my portion. Because I once said this to um, one of my fellow pastors, and I told him because he was busy telling me, Casper, you're gonna you're gonna go to hell. You're gonna be bent. Trust me, you better repent. Or that I was I was wondering what exactly do you feel like I need to repent about? If you, maybe if you can point it for me to help. She could not really point, and I was point blank with him. I said, "You know what? I, I'm not going to hell. I've, 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 I've managed to discover that hell is not is not mine. Okay, if I'm, I'm not going to be uh, heretic, right? I said, um, uh, God and and the devil had had a problem in heaven. 
and they fought. Right? God did not fight him actually. He sent Michael to fight the devil. And the Bible says and there was peace in heaven, which means there was, there was no peace when that guy was there in heaven. And with all the powers, with how powerful God is, with how, with all the angels, they failed, they failed him. And the Bible says, and he was thrown on earth. And an and angel stood and cried out with a loud voice, Woe unto you, earth! The beast has been thrown unto, unto, the, unto the world, un, on earth. And I was, that's, that's, this was me trying to think outside the box. Why would the, why would the angels throw the devil on earth? There was, there was Pluto and there was Mars, there was Jupiter. Why didn't they just catch mm -hmm. him somewhere mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. right. And now you saying, I'm going to hell because I've done something wrong, which the devil has made me to do, right? Everyone who's going to hell, they're going to hell because the devil has been using them. Which devil? He, the, their devil, the, whom they failed to deal with. Right. And they threw him on earth, on earth, where there is cast by a human being with flesh and blood. And the devil comes here, and now he's using me. And now you want to ban me because the devil that you have failed to cage maybe somewhere else or to put him somewhere else, that he is using me now. And when, he's, when he has used me, I'm supposed to be burned. I said, I'm not going to hell for one reason. This issue has never been dealt with. I'm not trying to be heretic, but I felt like I need to be, I, I, there has to be one person who stands uh, as an intermediator between people and God. At some point, God had said, I'm going to destroy this city. And his, God is a man of his word. And a certain men of God would rise and say, no, please serve them. And there was a time uh, when God had said, ah, these children of Israel, they're going to get out from this poverty, from this, um, from this oppression until 400 years. And they got into 430 years. It was God who had said 400, but they were there for 430 years until a certain prophet came in and said, no, this, this is wrong. Something is wrong with this. And he ended it. So I said, I am, I'm not going to hell, not because I'm holy. I'm not going to hell because I'm a child of God. Hmm. I know where I'm standing. I am a child of God. If the devil uses me, that does not make me the child of the devil. It doesn't make me a little devil. It makes me a child of God who has sinned. Hmm. So hell is not mine because I know where I'm standing. I'm standing on the blood of Jesus. I'm standing on the grace of God. So if you tell me that I'm going to hell because I've sinned, ah, I'm sorry, you'll find yourself there. I will not be in hell. You will not find me in hell. No matter how much sins you think I've committed, because I know where I'm standing. I am a child of God who has sinned. I'm not a little devil. So if God had a problem with the devil, they were supposed to just deal with this matter, the two of them. I do not know why this issue escalated to us on earth, to human beings, to be specific, to human beings. There are aliens there, people with no blood, with no feelings. They were supposed to just catch the devil there in Jupiter. We would not have a problem with him. I want to know why the devil has been allowed to come on earth where I am here so that I go to hell. Ah, I feel like this issue was not dealt with fairly because it was, they were supposed to just talk. You can't, you can't, you, you can't do that. Like you've got a fight with your, with your wife and you go to the next door and start beating people from the next door. That's not wrong. You face the one you've got a problem with. And maybe also because it was not God who dealt with the devil who threw him on earth. It was Mecca. So maybe he did not have a problem with him being thrown uh, on, 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 on earth. But we do have a problem with it. So if we are going to hell, if all of us are going to hell, I felt like I'm going to be a bitter, a bitter soul or a bitter ghost. I don't know. But I, would, I wouldn't want to get to hell because that devil you failed. With all the powers you failed him. And I'm going to help because the, that guy you failed is now using me. Who am I? I'm a human being with blood and flesh. You are all powerful with the angels. You had a serious fight. The Bible says, and there was, there was peace in heaven. Peace in heaven. Chaos on earth. How come? How come? Why am I supposed to go to hell because the devil you failed is now using me?
F fix the devil. Deal with your issue. The two of you, hey, Satan, you have failed. You have failed me. I think I'm not happy with you. I'm going to cage you for the next five million years. That did not have anything to do with us. If that issue was dealt with that way. Right? So my worshiping God is based on that belief that I'm a child of God. That is why even if I'm to, um, I'm to open a ministry again, I will never talk about, 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 I will never talk about hell. I will never talk about sins. I will talk about God himself. God's love. God's love. God's God grace. Yes. God's care. Yes, God's there provision. are other better things to be focusing on God's provision. than focusing on the devil. Sure. Yes. So I, I told myself, I said, if the devil, if, if, if the devil makes me do his stuff and he thinks I'm going to be his, he's lying. I was born of the blood. I'm standing on the grace of God. I'm standing on, not on my works, I'm standing on the grace. Because my works are not worth it. That's what I believe. Apostle Casper, um, what I got from this conversation is that you're a man who had to mature quickly, as you said because life through experiences to you once again got that God allowed where you lost sure. your parents, both of them, at a very young age. You then followed your calling and, uh, and responded to God, living a holy life, living a pure, a pure life. And then once again, life didn't turn out the way that you wanted it to be. Sure. You got into a marriage and that marriage didn't serve you. Um, obviously, there are nuances where you also might have made mistakes in that marriage and yeah. it's not entirely your, your wife's fault because you yeah. were young. There were mistakes you I made. I made so many the, mistakes. You made many mistakes. There, there were ways in which you didn't know how to respond in, yeah. in ways and know how to deal things. Mm -hmm. But what I get from this conversation conversation more importantly is that as leaders especially pastors leaders in the faith you guys are hurting and you have nowhere to go sure there is no one who's who's shielding you guys true. and there is no one who's giving you that support system that you need sure. so as we end this conversation um i always ask my guests this what's that one thing you know for sure just in one minute um i'm a strong believer on about my beliefs and i believe I believe in God, I believe in genuinity, I believe in being real, especially mm -hmm. when you are a pastor. I believe that you need to be yourself. Do not portray a certain image that you're not. Pastors, if pastors are listening to me right now, they know what I'm talking about. You do not need to portray a certain image that you know that you're not. You are not Jesus. You can never save everybody. Be yourself. If people are gonna come, people are gonna come and go. They are gonna lose. So never ever lose yourself in trying to save other people. You are also needed in heaven. God needs you there. So you might be busy trying to uh, save others, you know, trying to portray a certain image for your church while you're losing yourself. You know who really you are and you want to make sure that people have been gotten to their God-given destiny. But never forget yourself. Never mm -hmm. forget your family. You will die at a younger age. You will have uncured diseases. You will make drastic decisions. Why? Because you do not want to be yourself. You think of other people. You, we all know a lot of things are happening. Pastors may get on stage and start preaching about this and that. Oh, stop that. That's, that's ungodly. When you know pastors out there are busy sleeping with church members, they can sleep with the whole choir. You know? And when he gets on the pulpit... It's just looking at one person who has done something wrong and they want that person to be expelled out of church. That's hypocrisy. You know what pastors does. You know what's happening there. So be real and be genuine. Point people back to Jesus Christ. Do not point people to yourself. You are not Jesus Christ. You cannot serve them all. Be yourself so that one day if they find you holding a castle like or holding a black label, they will never judge you because you've told them to. You've already, always been pointing them back to Jesus. You are not pointing them back to you. Take people back to their God. You are not God. You cannot serve them all. Fix your marriage. Fix your children. Fix your family. And make sure that you are yourself. If you, are, if you, if you need to put on a tracksuit for you to go and preach to church, put on a tracksuit. Don't try to portray a certain image of you wearing a suit like you are this a God, 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 Father. You do not need that. Thank you. Apostle Casper, thank you so much for your time. Sure. The show is Engineer Your Life, and I'm Lungelo KM. I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.
Introducing the epitome of luxury living. Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.